Thank you, Mrs. Mitchell, for singing that. I was a blessing. If you have your Bibles, open to the book of Psalms, in chapter 90, the book of Psalms, the 90th Psalm. If you would, please, tonight, I often, when a lady is singing, enjoying while she's singing Miss Mitchell, but also uh, watching uh, their spouse. And so I have teased uh, Brother Green before when Mrs. Green is singing. Brother, Brother Paul Green has just a smile on his face while she's singing. And Brother Mitchell had the same smile on his face tonight for Mrs. Mitchell. And, uh, but I must admit, when I'm singing, I look at Doreen. She looks at me. She's smiling at me. And uh, she says she thinks I sing pretty good. And so she wouldn't lie to me, now would she? What are you trying to say? <laughs> no. But I appreciate that. I appreciate all the music tonight. And while you're doing Psalm chapter 90 tonight, we open up God's Word again and look at some truths from God's Word. Last week, looked at the parable of the talents. Now, we are challenged as Christians to use what God has given to us to further His kingdom. I am not here just for me. You are not here just for you. We are here for Him. And the time we have in tonight, I've entitled the message this way, Life is short. Life is short. Someone said it this way, anyone who says life is short has never sat through math class before. There is probably some truth to that. I'd go a step further, anyone who says life is short has never been under the drill of a dentist. Do you think they turn that on on purpose early? I mean, is it a real drill? They turn your dental drill sound, click the switch. How many enjoy... I'm not going to ask that question, enjoy the dentist. There are those who fear the dentist. In fact, they say that people will more willingly change a doctor than to dentist. So they say, I don't know who they is or who they asked, but uh, some of you would prefer that to be true. But this psalm, Psalm number 90, deals right in the middle of the psalm. Verse number 12, we'll read the whole psalm. But verse number 12, I would say, is kind of the pivotal key truth in this particular psalm. Where kind of the psalmist has begun a certain path and ended up. In fact, if you look at the top of the psalm in your Bible, it probably will say this, a psalm of Moses. Do you see that? Does it say a man of God as well? It says that, doesn't it, in your, in your Bible? says in mine as well. The only psalm in the book of Psalms that we have that was written by Moses. A couple other psalms we have in, in, uh, in the early books of the Bible, but the only one in the book of Psalms written by Moses. Called out, all right, to lead God's chosen people out of bondage into the promised land. That Moses. The same Moses who got to speak and listen from God, in one sense, the Bible says, face to face. Got to see the glory of God, and, and the Bible says his hinder parts are, or the back of God's glory as it went past. So much so that his face shone so brightly that they could not look upon him, and they made Moses put a veil. The first mask, if I may. It's so bright. That Moses. That same Moses, the same Moses who also was guilty of murder and ran out of shame and guilt. That same Moses. The same Moses who was in the wilderness tending sheep for 40 years. That same Moses. That's the Moses we're talking about called a man of God. The Bible tells us, according to God's testimony, that Moses was the meekest man who ever lived. He is called the friend of God. But Moses, a tremendous, a tremendous man, a man of God with, fa flaw, with flaws and faults, but called here a man of God. Moses, who got to have some stone tablets that were written with the finger, the very finger of God. I've had some treasures in my life, some things passed down, an inheritance type of things. One of those such things is a Bible from Pastor Olette. In our transition service, he gave me one of his first Bibles he had when he became pastor, along with some sermon notes. I know what you're thinking. Well, Pastor, preach those because they're the good ones. <laughs> but it's a tremendous treasure. I've used it to preach, but it's on a shelf in my office, a prominent display in my office. I cherish that. I, I appreciate that. I've got some things passed down from the other side of my family as well. I'm John D. Howell the Fourth. Right, that means there are three other men before me, and Johnny is the fifth. I wasn't going to name him Johnny, but my wife really pushed me to it. She said, you can't stop this now. 
special things. But can you imagine having these tablets that were written or given to you by God himself? How you would cherish them? Remember, the first set were destroyed. Moses came down off that mountain, this same Moses, and saw how the people, the children of Israel, those who were rescued by God's mighty hand through the plagues, rescued through God's mighty hand, and right after that were shown the power of God at the Red Sea. Those same people, how quickly they turned and worshipped a golden calf. This same Moses. Moses in this psalm turns our attention to God and then he makes this statement, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to your wisdom. Would you read with me and look with me in Psalm chapter 90 to look at God's word tonight and look at this idea, life is short. Verse number 1, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up, and the evening is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thy anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet it is their strength, labor, and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy, uh, let, let thy work appear unto the servants and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight. Lord, we have just a few moments together. In light of eternity, Lord, just a, just a millisecond of time tonight. But Lord, how this truth, if we'll let it, will touch us and change us. Lord, help your word to be, to be unhindered as it touches hearts tonight. Would your spirit convict us and correct us? Lord, may we respond. May we be good soil. Lord, if there's an area in our life that we've been negligent, resistant to you, Lord, help us tonight to respond to your light your truth. Lord, help us to realize how truly short life is. Lord, we give you the honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Life is short. Now, some of you who are my elder tonight will say, Oh, Brother Howell, you have no idea how short life is. I've heard this phrase in a variety of manners and ways since coming here to First Baptist Church, and I thank you all for that. No matter what stage in life I happen to be at, some of you have the desire to tell me how bad the next phase is. Thank you for that. Since I don't have much peasants, uh, uh, but since I'm fairly optimistic in my life, some of you are on the opposite side for me. When I was, wasn't married, you said, oh, just wait till you're married. It's not all fun and games. Kids, life. You think life's going fast now? Just wait, just wait. The fact is the Bible tells us that life is short. I don't need you to tell me that. The Bible tells me that. Oh, we are shaped by our view of life. We are shaped by our view of life. I found some phrases out there in the world of phrases about what to do because life is short. Unsafe people have a theory about this. They have a philosophy about this. They say things like this. Life is short. It is up to you to make it sweet. 
Now, this is not my message, but I am glad. Let me just say this. I am glad that it's not up to me to make life sweet. I am glad I have a sweet Savior and a loving Heavenly Father who can make my life sweet and special. If it's up to me, I'm going to make a mess of things, and so are you. Philosophy, life is short. It's up to you to make it sweet. Life is too short to choose to be unhappy. Life is short. Always choose happiness. Hmm. I enjoyed this one. Life is short and so am I. <laughs> Fair enough. And this one now, some of the other ones were humorous. This one is real. But this one is true. This one you can write down. You've taken notes. Write this down. Maybe in the flyleaf of your Bible. Life is short. Enjoy the coffee. <laughs> right there. I said, okay, there's some wisdom right there. One said, life is short, so live it. What does that even mean? If you ever see these phrases, some of you ladies like to go on Pinterest. They have these things. I could preach on Pinterest one night. I probably could. I probably should, actually. No, my wife says, no way. But, but stop for a moment. When you're out there and you hear these things, make sure you run up against God's Word. Make sure you don't just, just repost these things and say, oh, that sounds so special. Life is short, so live it. Listen, what else can you do? Because when you stop living, life is over. Okay, so life, okay, make sure you keep your head connected when you're out there, all right? Make sure you think about the truth from God's word and, and life is short, so live it. But can we say this? Life is short, so live for God. All right, we can stop right there, but I won't, all right? This sermon may be short, but that, <laughs> life is short, so live for God. That's where we're going tonight. Life is short, so live for God. That's what he says in verse number 17. Look there, would, would you please? And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. At the end of the psalm, all right, Moses says this, you know, God's beauty, can it be upon me? And can his help, can he establish what I do so that what I do counts for him? Life is short, so live for God. I want to look tonight at this concept, life is short. There are some names you may not recognize, Owen D. Young, maybe some of you may, Pierre, Laval, Hugh Johnson, James Burns, Harlow Curtis. These names ringing a bell? Well, they ought to. They were all at one point on the cover of Time Magazine Man or Person of the Year. According to Time Magazine, these particular individuals, they were the most influential person for that entire year. And now, if you knew a name... If you recognize the name, it would be a rare thing. How quickly people can come on the scene and off the scene. In fact, if you look at that list as I did, you'll find they honored the earth one year. Man of the year was the earth. Another year, person of the year, the computer. Help me here. Help me here. The scratch in my head. Life is short though. But in this psalm, we have the idea of an eternal God and the truth He has for us. I believe that this verse ought to drive us to three things tonight. Three truths that this verse will drive us to. The first truth is this. Because life is short, we need to pursue. Pursue because someone knows more than me. All right, now that's just not me saying that. I want us to believe that and you to say that. Someone knows more than me. Would you say that with me? Someone knows more than me. In fact, in this psalm, in verse number 12, how does Moses say that? He says, so teach us. Who is he speaking to? I'll help you. To God. To God. He's not Googling that phrase. He's not asking his buddies. He's not looking around for the philosophers of the day. He's talking to the God of the universe, and he says to the eternal God, would you just teach us? So teach us. Because someone, as Moses acknowledges, someone knows more than you. Someone knows more than me. I want the one who brought life to teach me about life. I want the one who gives life to show me about life. I want the one who is life to be my life. So Paul says in Colossians, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. You see, when you don't have the answers, look to Jesus. Life is short. Don't waste it trying to figure it out yourself. The first part of the chapter tells us that when, when Moses says in verse 1, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. 
He begins to talk about the eternality of God and the wisdom and the, just how big God is. He says, God, Lord, you've been around for all generations. He begins in verse number two to talk about how before creation God was there. He was in charge and knew all that. He says in verse number four, for a thousand years are in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past. What is a thousand years to God? Just a little snap. Just a little snap. And yet, if we're not careful too often, we don't turn to God. We turn to Google. We turn to Siri. We turn to Alexa. We turn to our friends. We turn to social media. Parents, have you ever seen yourself reflected in your children? That's a humbling thing. Remember when one of my young children were younger... They had an idea. They wanted to do something. Something that I could easily have helped them accomplish. Something that would have taken very little time, very little effort. That one, one, one looked at me and said, No, Daddy, me do it. Me do it. And I watched him struggle while me did it. Me did it. And I must confess, there are times in my life, it's like I say to God, No, me do it. Me do it. Would not cost God any amount of his power, now would it? Wouldn't cost him any kind of wisdom to help me through it. Life is short. Don't waste it trying to run it yourself. Oh, when Johnny was young, we're out there one day, and I said, Johnny, let's skip. He looked at me with those big eyes and said, Daddy, what is skip? Hit me that day how he wouldn't know what skip is, unless I didn't tell him. He hasn't asked me that question in a long time. Daddy, what's skip? I don't ever want to get over looking to God and say, God, what's skip? How should I live today? I don't want to think, I know what to do now. I want to pursue God because someone knows more than me. Men or ladies, have you ever tried to put together furniture that comes in in those boxes? Some of those particle board furniture pieces? I know you ought to buy the real wood things, but sometimes those particle board pieces are just handy in life. All right? Am I the only one who's put these things together? Well, okay, someone else. Thank you, Brother Camp. He has as well. I see a couple of hands. All right. So you get these boxes, all right, men and ladies, and you've probably seen these things, and they have these, all these holes all over the place, right? They give you these instructions that are in every language but English, all right? And uh, when you find the English side, you flip it upside down, and they give you all these different size screws, and, and they say, you know, use the M8 ones and the M12 ones, and then they give you the smallest tube of glue known to man. You know what I'm talking about? They're about this big. And you're building like the back of the stage, right? I've done this before, and, and by the time I get to the second screw, I'm going out to the wood shop to get my glue. You look at the instructions, they said only glue one spot over here, and I've glued everything. <laughs> it is never coming apart, nor will the drawers open. Okay. And my wife, honey, I thought this had drawers in. Nope, those are fake drawers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just looks real nice, all right? You can put stuff on top of the shelving unit. I've been guilty of that, but how many times in our lives, because we think we can figure it out, because we think we can do it, because we think we're smarter than the instructions and smarter than the Creator, do we take those things and say, I've got this all figured out. Life is short. Don't try to run it yourself. Pursue because someone knows more than me. When was the last time you asked God how to live? When was the last time you said, God, show me today how to live? Lord, give me wisdom how to drive today. Oh, brother, I can drive just fine. No, I've seen some of you drive. You need to pray for you drive. I'm just kidding with you, but when was the last time you asked God to help you when you get your paycheck? Lord, help me put this money in the right place. Put this in the right, the, the right place. Help me to, to be and, and do with the, these things like you have me. When was the last time you asked God how to work on a project? How to talk to your friends? When have you asked God how to help you live? Life is short, so pursue. Someone knows more than me. And someone knows more than you. Life is short. There's a pursuit. There's also perception I see in this verse. He says this, so teach us, the next little phrase, to number our days. We have to perceive because our time on earth isn't infinite. We say that phrase with me, our time on earth isn't infinite. 
You say, of course, I know it's not infinite. I know there's 24 hours in a day and eventually, the, you know, the, in fact, here the psalmist says how much time we're given on earth and it's about 70 years and maybe we'll have 10 more and, and boy, I teach senior Bible class in the school. I see some of my former students in here and some who will be my students this year. There is a phrase that I like to say in Bible class. Mason may remember this phrase. I, I will make you remember, but he will. The phrase goes like this. Why do today what I can do tomorrow? Remember that, Alex? Why do today what we can do tomorrow? Listen, seniors, don't worry about it. So what I say now, with a, with a touch, with just a touch of sarcasm, if you can imagine that. Can you imagine that our seniors at school would ever procrastinate? Can you imagine that? And I say, no, don't worry about that. Oh, no, you have plenty of time. Put it off. Wait to study. Wait to complete this assignment. Don't rush about these things. You know, why do today what we can do tomorrow? The fact is, many of us live that way. Now, some, some who may live this way on a, on a character level have a lot of character and in a job situation would not procrastinate, but with life we procrastinate. I believe that one of Satan's biggest deceptions, one of his biggest lies is not not to follow God, but just to do it tomorrow. You know what? That's a great truth from God's Word. And you know what? You ought to change that. You ought to get that right. And you should just do it tomorrow. Just do it at the next service. You know your neighbor, they need the gospel. And you should give them the gospel. Would you just do it in an hour or two hours? You see how if we're not careful that we will live like life is infinite, when in reality the psalmist says, so teach us to number our days. That means to count them or to make them count accountable to us. Where we take accounting of the days and say, I only have this much time, so how can I make these days count for Jesus Christ? So teach us to number our days. How many Sunday school lessons will be taught tomorrow? How many tracts will be passed out tomorrow? How many ministries will start tomorrow? How many souls will be led to Christ tomorrow? How many apologies will be whispered tomorrow? How many words of encouragement will be given tomorrow? So teach us to number our days. Sometimes in our life, we have a life procrastination problem. The story told about an old farm boy, or young farm boy, old story, young farm boy. He accidentally overturned a wagon load of corn in the road. The old farmer who lived nearby came to investigate. Hey, Willis, he called out. Forget your troubles for a spell and come over to our house and have dinner with us. Then I'll help you get that wagon turned over. Well, that's mighty nice of you, Willis responded. But I don't think Paul would like me to do that. Oh, come on, son. Finally, the boy said, okay, I'll come with you. They had a great dinner and sitting down. And after a hearty meal, Willis thanked his host. I feel a lot better now, but I just know Paul's going to be real upset. Don't be foolish, the neighbor exclaimed. By the way, where is Paul? The boy replied, under the wagon. Someone said this, procrastination is my sin. It brings me naught but sorrow. I know that I should stop it. In fact, I will tomorrow. Remember, today is a tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Let me say that one more time. You get that. Today is a tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Life is short. Don't waste it waiting for tomorrow. Not only is there a pursuit, there's a perception. I have to realize that life is not infinite. I don't have anything promised to me. In fact, I may never make it home tonight. This may be the last message I ever speak. I may not make it through the message. But we don't live that way. We live, as James tells us, we're making plans here and there rather than saying, if God be willing, the Christian, my friend, don't be so naive to think that life is infinite. And though we may profess that we don't, don't live that way. Last is this, the third truth in this passage, in this verse, is a pursuit of perception. But lastly, there's a practice. 
You know that anytime we read God's Word, there ought to be something that we do about it. Something that we act upon. God's Word is not there just so we feel good about ourselves, not so we can hear something nice. It's because we're supposed to do something about it. And that's what this verse says. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Someone took the time to figure out how a typical lifespan of 70 years is spent. They said that you sleep approximately 23 years of your life away. You work approximately 16 years. About eight years of your life is given to TV and six years is given to eating. Six years to travel and four and a half years to leisurely things. Illness is four years of your life. You're sick. They say that you spend the time getting dressed about two years of your life. According to their calculation, religion in many people's lives is computed to half a year. Half a year. Their study, not mine. Isn't it sad to think that we would spend more time getting dressed than we would with the God of the universe? I hope if, he were to, if they were to study my life or your life, that would not be the numbers that they would bring back. Would you not hope the same thing? Would you not hope that, that religion or worshiping God and serving God would be a much, a much higher number? There's a practice, live life in light of eternity. Would you say that with me? A practice to live life in light of eternity. See, wisdom is that truth that must shape my view. We often perceive life based on how things are going around us. When everyone's healthy, life is good. When they're sick, life is bad. When the cars are running good, life is good. When something breaks down, life is bad. When the bills are paid, life is good. When they're not paid, life is bad. Wisdom brings us to, to apply our hearts to it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's why in verses 13 through 17... The psalmist begins to talk about what it looks like when God runs a life. We can, in verse number 15, makes us glad according to the days. Verse number 16, let thy work appear to thy servants. My heart is turned toward him. And like we talked about verse number 17, the beauty of our Lord God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Someone said this, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. It was about a week, a week and a half ago when it really struck me how I could really see the end times coming upon us. It struck me how we know the Antichrist eventually will come on the scene, read Revelations. But can you not see in this current climate that we're in how someone could come on the scene and mass hysteria could follow? Can you not see that? How, how one and whatever set of, uh, whatever paradigm they want to say, how you can move an entire world. You see that? Can you not see that? Can, can you not see how, how this is possible now? Maybe at, at, at no other time in history that it is greater than it is now. Can, can you not see? It says in the Revelations that with the mark of the beast, that anyone who does not receive the mark of the beast, others will hunt them down. Can you not see... How that's even possible now. People policing everyone else right now. It really just struck me the other day, and I'm not here to fear monger. I'm just saying it struck me. I'm, I'm driving down the road, and it really just struck me. Wow, I can see how these things are coming together. And then, of course, in the middle of the study, the next thought that hit me, life is short. Life is short. I read recently about how two people passed away fighting over masks and Lansing. Two guys arguing in a store and the one guy pulled out a knife and stabbed the other guy. Stabbed him over an argument. The police were called. The man who did the stabbing rushed off and the police went to pull him over. He jumped out of the car apparently and ran toward the police with the knife. And they shot him. What's going on? Life is short. Can't you see it? Life is short. Life is short. So make sure that you live a little differently and pursue the one who knows life. Life is short. So don't live like it's endless and have the perception. And life is short. So you make sure you live like this is not all there is. Many of you men and many of you ladies love to fish. 
You know, I've never heard an avid fisherman say, do I have to go back to the lake? Do I have to go back to the store and shop some more, those who are shoppers? I've never heard the committed sports fan say, do I have to go back and watch another game? I've never heard that from a committed sports fan. I've never heard a foodie, someone who loves food, say, do I have to try a new restaurant or go back to my favorite restaurant? I've never heard that. I've never heard a new devoted mom say, do I have to hold my baby? Oh, I've seen Mrs. McCurdy and, and Mrs. Koblenz holding those new little ones, right? They're not complaining at all, are they? Yeah, we have Christians, don't we? Christians. Saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Do I have to go to church? Do I have to go to church? I have to go back to church two times on Sunday? Well, come on, pastor. What's wrong here? Do I have to go back to church? I have to serve at church? You mean I can't just go there and sit and be fed, spoon-fed? Do, do I have to actually give them the blessings that God gave to me? Do I have to do that? I've never seen that with a sportsman. I've never seen it with a foodie. I've never seen it with a shopaholic. But I've seen it with some Christians. And we should have more reason. More reason. To say life is short. God, may my life count for you. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. It was the last time. Do you remember life is short? Look at Moses, writer of this psalm. All that he's seen, all that he's experienced, yet Moses with a prayer, so teach us to number our days. Or can we say it this way? Life is short. Make it count for Jesus Christ. Amen. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, you're merciful and gracious to us. Lord, tonight, I believe you want our hearts to turn toward how we ought to be living for you. Lord, forgive us for those times that we have gone about our days with only our own thoughts on our minds. Not a care in the world. Lord, help us live for you. My friend, maybe here tonight, God touched your heart. Just a moment, we'll stand. If God's touched your heart, would you respond to him? Would you give your life back over to him? Let him make it count for something. Well, it doesn't matter if you're five or 75. Jesus can make your life count for him. Lord, may we give you control. May we respond to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Piano is already playing. You stand to your feet. If God's touched your heart, the altar is open. Life is short. Make it count for Jesus Christ.